So welcome everyone to School 42. For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome and please join us afterwards for a tour around the school. Um, we would love to take you around. And uh, so today we have our fourth master class uh, in this edition of master classes by uh, Women in Tech that Carolina Natal has organized with us. And I call her to the stage. So welcome, Carolina. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Carol. So if uh, Carol is a problem, two Carols together is a huge problem. Um, and the idea behind these master classes is to deconstruct a little bit the idea that the computer is a black box. And um, we have actually very good brains here in Portugal working in those fields. And that's why we wanted to introduce you some of these topics. Today, it's going to be one of my personal favorites because I'm now studying AI. And the future of AI hardware is insane. Like, we're going to have Dr. Alzal with us today, which I call to the stage, yes, which is a <laughs> very very passionate teacher and also a very good friend. And I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you for accepting this invitation. And yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carolina. OK. Uh, good evening, everybody. I am Asal. I was introduced by uh, Carolina already. And uh, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. And it's first time I'm here. I didn't know even the existence of this school. And I would propose actually to my PhD students to be more invo involved here. And uh, uh, today my talk is going to be about future AI hardware. I should tell you that I cannot handle laser and this uh, mic at the same time. So I may jump here and just show you things. So don't get surprised. So uh, in this uh, slide, I would like to show you that artificial intelligence technology is actually older than internet. So the term artificial intelligence was born at a conference at Dartmouth College in 1956. And here we have the photo of John McCarthy, who is a scientist of first wave of the AI and working in this area. And then Decade afterwards, the internet was born. Actually, the first one is the, perhaps you already know it, but just as a review, like ARPANET was established by the United States Department of uh, Defense. And it was uh, during uh, uh, Cold War that uh, military commandos uh, required to have this computer communication without a, a, a headquarter because uh, if the headquarter is attacked, then all the network, entire network is blacked out. So uh, they were seeking for solution and then they came up with the ARPANET solution, as you see the map here. And uh, it evolved uh, gradually and nowadays we have to uh, today's internet, like what now we are actually having in uh, nowadays. Here, I would like also to talk about this traditional scaling of semiconductor technology. I hope I am not very technical. I try to be very understandable, but you can interrupt me and ask me questions. We don't need to wait for the even like the last session. Uh, so I have this uh, graph, this plot here showing you the which is just a single observation of the number of transistors on integrated circuits, which is called IC, that is doubled every two years. And this graph and this uh, statistic worked for six decades. But nowadays, Moore's law, this is a famous Moore's law, uh, cannot uh, have further progress. And this further progress, in fact, will push the uh, boundaries of physics. So like physically, it's not possible, and also economy. Here, I put a photo of Moore because he passed away this year, in fact. It was in March 2023. This year, actually, we lost also the father of semiconductor memory technology, who was there. And 6 November, he passed away. So this year was quite uh, drastic for memory science, I would say. And here, I have an image for you just uh, to show the comparison of this um, uh, the number of transistors. The first one in 1978 is the 
three micrometer process of transistor compared to 14 nanometer process in 2018. And you see like the number of the transistor of, uh, of uh, paths was 29,000 transistor per IC and then nowadays billions and billions of transistor, right? So electronic, uh, lo look at the electronic industry. So we had all these devices in the past. So if we look at the past, so we had different devices, different electronic devices with, with various functionalities, like one camera, one uh, uh, Walkman video, and so on. And then now we have everything in our mobile phone and then in future like future and even the development is like internet of things what does it mean it means like we want to have actually a lot of functionality but then they need to talk to each other so they are connected so we want to put sensors everywhere so towards building like a smart house towards building like a smart like variables in healthcare application and so on a smart cities autonomous driving and so on and so on so um, uh -huh. besides that, so everybody knows about this uh, energy intensive language models like Alexa, Siri, ChatGPT, these are also other developments in AI area. So from now on, I would like to actually talk about computation carbon footprints, what we do, what we face, what we have, and what we need to deal with. So there are certain channel challenges here. And uh, uh, as an example, definitely many of you already know this Von Neumann bottleneck. Von Neumann is a computing system. So all of our systems and computers is based on Von Neumann architecture, meaning that the processing or CPU or the system that is responsible for processing has a certain distance to the memory unit and a data box in between, right? All the time, shuffling data between CP CPU and RAM in a continuous cycle. So imagine on this image, this board, that the, this distance in four is four centimeter. And then I want to give you a bit more clear, actually, uh, 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 relation to this distance. So it's this four centimeter is million times larger than the size of a single transistor, for example, a 40 nanometer transistor. So you already have had also with Tiana nanotechnology masterclass, so you know what I am talking about. So it is equivalent to a human walking of 1,000 kilometers. So imagine yourself walk 1,000 kilometers to fetch data and come back, back, forth, back, forth. So this is really what is happening in von Neumann, which is a bottleneck. And everybody tries like from the industry, academy, and uh, so on in science to uh, tackle this problem. So if even we look at the AI market grow, so uh, growing, uh, which is, I have this plot here showing the present market value is like around 100 billion US dollar. And then this modern age AI, like nowadays and today AI actually is uh, like transferring this data and 80% of the time and power is in this transmission line, like the data transfer. And at the same time, you put sensors everywhere. So where the data is gonna be computed, you send this huge amount of data to the cloud and it's gonna be computed and it's gonna come back and then you have also privacy issue if it is a med medical data, right? So latency, privacy, and a lot of um, uh, these sorts of uh, problem. Let's look at this, uh, 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 this graph, energy consumption that was presented uh, in one of the conference actually last year, and uh, which shows that in fact these big tech chatbots, all of these chat GPT and so on and so on, all of these uh, language, uh, natural language models and so on, like this race, at one day may blow a fuse. So we need really to come up with the market dynamics to uh, limited scenarios to handle the energy. So let's look at this uh, news, for example, this one. Tsunami of data could consume one fifth of global electricity by 2025. There was another news actually in German, I didn't put it here. It was uh, showing like the cl cloud center that in Frankfurt, they can actually warm up the city with the heat produced with the center. If there is a mechanism, okay, there is no mechanism. But if there is a mechanism and science be like behind, they can actually do that. And also go to the science, 
there is this report from MIT that showed that training a single AI model can emit as much carbon as five cars in their entire lifetime. So deep learning has a terrible carbon footprint and um, uh, uh, we need really novel paradigms. We need really to have something not exactly based on one human computation. So another type of con com uh, computation and configuration. So here I have just some entertainment. As you know, perhaps you already had some machine learning course and so on. These examples are normally used in pattern recognition classes. But I'm gonna say, so how good is AI compared to brain if you have a toddler and you show these images, this is a problem, this is a famous problem call, called like sh uh, Chihuahua and Muffy. So uh, you show three example, two examples to your child and of course the toddler can recognize it. So you show the second, third, fourth, fifth and it is, she never missed this. But a machine, how many data you need to, you know, a pipeline of data you need to give to have an efficient accuracy, right? So by now, really brain is efficient. But again, have a look on this example. How do you characterize this following object and in between? What are the key keys and what are the blue bars? So majority of people say the blue bars are the ones round and the key keys are the ones that are in triangle because we have unconscious brain bias. This should be avoided by AI machine and this can be avoided also in the programming. So human perception and pre-perception can easily lead to bias conclusion. And another example of the comparison of the AI machine to brain, brain is much slower. So our frequency is in milliseconds, but machines, SRAM, DRAMs and so on, they work in, they compute things in nanoseconds, right? So it's really, faster in terms of like this kind of dynamic comparison. So as uh, we reach to uh, the, uh, this modern HAI uh, and the problems that are written here in red, that latency issue, privacy issues, huge power consumption and approaching um, scale limits as I showed it in Moore's law. So what is gonna be next generation of the AI? It's gonna be normative computing. It's gonna be brain inspired computing model. And we need a, s a single device or a hardware that can emulate biological neurons and synapse in this regard. So we need to build artificial synapse artificial neurons that function exactly as our brain functions. So there is no CPU or memory or data bus. Everything happens in this chaotic uh, system and I call it biological neural network, like completely different. And there we have real-time data analysis, memory centric computation. So you store in memory, you compute also in the same place, in the same physical location power efficient system and also high density information. So there is uh, the solution. Let us go a little bit into some buzzwords. So what actually I am gonna present, like we wanna have some edge device between like interfacing the device level where you have all of your sensors and IOT, like internet of things on top and edge device between the device level and the cloud devices here. And also I uh, bring you just uh, how uh, uh, some numbers, like how we can say that the, the efficiency or energy efficiency is uh, mainly defined as a number of synaptic operations per second per watt. So in the brain, human brain has 10 to power of 14, actually, like the EDC scale compared to the one of these neuromorphic computing systems that exist for, for example, brain scale and those machines. So they are really three, four orders of magnitude lower in terms of efficiency. Here also I put just something that it is uh, for you, of course, I believe many of you knows that for the machine learning tasks that we, uh, we wanna build actually this AI hardware to do efficient machine learning uh, tasks, we know that we need to have a lot of data to do and the answer and then we receive the program. So this device sh should handle 
like the paradigm, the architecture that we go through it in later on should handle such a thing on hardware. So now from now on, we want to actually move to the hardware and then have some uh, presenting an artificial synapse, which is a memory store. A resistor which has a memory effect. So it's different from a resistor. It can remember the past. It can function exactly like synapse. It can show this potentiation and depression as a real biological synapse when it is actually influenced by spikes, exactly what is happening in our brain. And here I have an example of one of these artificial synapses. It's a two terminal. When we say terminal, is like about this uh, device stack. So transistor is three terminal and memory store is two terminal. So it's like just uh, like uh, I use this technical word, so it's a two terminal device. The fastest device that uh, was presented so on has a speed of 50 picosecond. And also the smallest is four square nanometer. And uh, this device has uh, I I I is the simplest hardware that can show, in fact, the plasticity. Let us have a look at um, artificial neural network, what is happening on the software that we want to do it actually on the hardware and build our edge device. Because if we can't perform it on the hardware, then we have all uh, classification or everything we want labeled and then we send little amount of data at least to the cloud. So it's going to be really efficient. So. We have these uh, 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 nodes, like neurons and uh, different layers. That input layer is normally our input, like a data. And then we have some hidden layers that is depending on the features or they, they perform computation. So and uh, we can define this number of the hidden layers and then output layer based on what we want to get as a result. Here also, I've put the image of the neuron and the synapses and equivalent mathematical function below show what is happening in our neurons. So it's like uh, synaptic rates, all of these W here are synaptic rates are summed and then reaching to some threshold. And then afterwards, if it is reached to that threshold, then the firing is triggered. The neuron is fired, so we say. So this is like equivalent mathematical equation of that and then what is happening in the artificial neural network is like matrix vector multiplication is the principle of the, um, uh, the solution uh, and solving. And we want to actually have a physical system directly mapping this AI algorithm on the, uh, on the device. So here I have just an example of an image. Perhaps uh, this is like a sort of review for you. And then I, uh, this image is 15 times 15, which is tw 225 of input. And then I just put it here that what is happening between my neural network is like matrix vector multiplication, as you see here. And we want to perform the same thing on the hardware. So here I put my mathematical matrix. This is something that we have, like, like of course, we know it from the high school. And this is a device on electronic that I am going to show you. So all in the electronic uh, like platform, in every intersect, we have the artificial synapse. And then what is happening, you have a vector of the voltage application, and then you get the results by, I use these words, with, but I, I'm sure like you are familiar with it from even high school. So by Ohm's law, we can mul have multiplication, and by Kirchhoff's law, we can have actually the summation. And this is like Mac operation, like here, r right? Like um, you want to perform such a thing on the device, and this is what we do. This looks simple. So we put devices, we put synapses in between, and this is done. No, it's not that simple. As I show here, challenges of ANN hardware. So for artificial neural network hardware, if you have conductance variability, so there are four challenges here. What does it mean, conductance variability? If device one is not similar to device two, so it means my nodes are not similar as it is defined in the software, so then I have problem accuracy drops. You train it, but when you go to see, it's not actually what you did because you have a drift. If you have a drift, for example, you train it and you reach to some level, but the device has some drift, has some leakage, we call, like the electrons are like not uh, staying there. 
then there is a problem. The device, electronic device, of course it has noise. Noise is a problem, right? So we don't want a noise there. And linearity, you are dealing with mathematics, right? So you want a linear response. You don't want to have like once the function works with a different um, simple uh, multiplication and another time giving you another result. So you need really linear response. And now from here, mm, onward I want to just uh, tackle like one of the problem that we have for example as a microelectronic engineer in in, uh, in university how we actually solve some problems this is shown like the plasticity of the single synapse here based on the spike the amplitude of a spike can be different the time of the spike it's exactly like our neuron neuronal system can be different and normally this um, relation is uh, exponential. So what I mean, the potentiation and depression and plasticity has exponential response as shown here. We don't want it. We want to have linear response, but this is how it works in our AI hardware. So a microelectronic engineer starts to think it differently. Let me change the pulse scheme, like have a modulation on pulse scheme. What is pulse scheme? It's exactly those uh, spikes that come and we have perception, right? In cognitive tasks, in everything. So to modulate it, if we have identical pulse, the amplitude of the pulse and time is really the same, so we have exponential. Let us change it. So let us change the amplitude a bit and have some incremental amplitude. Okay, let us change it further, have even change the, the timing of this pulse. Okay, it is still not very linear. So let us change both incremental amplitude and time. And here we go. We have really a linear. So we play actually with this scheme of the pulses to see how we can modulate our electronic system by introduction of different actually pulsing or spiking to the system. So as soon as we solve the problem, then, and we have a linear response and it works very well over many cycles, which you need for trainings, which you need for really uh, uh, performance of your, uh, your network, then we go and build a device. So here, I show you a, a memory store here, which is like this device that has the two and the transistor nearby, just to show you the scaling that memory store actually is very, very small. And this transistor is a switch, like a switch of the, like on, off, but we need it to be there, seated there. And then we build um, this uh, and uh, perform also this plasticity characteristics. And then afterwards you are familiar with this, perhaps like we try to simulate it and see, okay, if my artificial synapse is gonna work in our uh, AI hardware, how it's gonna be accuracy. So we uh, fed the, mm, uh, this, uh, this is the simulator uh, with our uh, synaptic characteristics, once exponential, once linear. Here is a task, it's like a based on recognition of the MNIST, uh, handwritten digits. And then we did some pattern recognition and clearly we see if we have exponential response, the results is gonna be the accuracy is around like 77 uh, percentage. And if we have linear response, the accuracy is actually very nice. Of course, it's not reaching to the software yet. So we are uh, still on the development and it's really on hardware. So it's not gonna be uh, as easy as you change things in the code. We need to change actually a lot of things in fab fabs, like fabrication of the devices and hardware. So here we go. So we have everything. Let us build a crossbar. Let us map, let us have this um, uh, vector matrix multiplication with vector of the voltage and map the conductance so it works very nice and perfectly so afterwards since our technology is dealing with the uh, flexible uh, like it is adapted for flexible substrates so we build actually these um, crossbar on the flexible substrate towards variables using it as an edge device on variables and so on and in fact, it works well. And we tested, we bent the device, and we try to have this um, vector matrix multiplication, and it worked quite well. 
So I would like actually to finalize my speech <laughs> or my talk uh, by showing these great scientists, they are alive, okay? So, and uh, one of them is Shuo, who uh, came up with the memory store idea and uh, like a mathematical functions. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, in 75, he had an article showing that um, uh, introduced there should be another fundamental uh, passive element uh, that is called memory register and memory store. Because this element, based on the mathematical functions and all the theories that he developed, this property cannot be replicated by a capacitor or by a resistor or by inductor. So a passive element is missing in the electronic area and it's called memory store. But it took 40 years that this theory come to, a to be formed as a physical device. And I should say thanks to nanotechnology because then afterwards in HP, HP group like and lead, led by uh, Stanley Williams. So they uh, started to work on it and build the first physical device just because of advancement that we have in nanotechnology because this device works only if we build it in the nano scale. It's a sub micro device. And then afterwards they published this letter, this um, in Nature in um, 2008 the missing memory store, the missing passive element was found. And uh, there are a lot of, of course, research nowadays. This, um, uh, we don't have it still in the industry, just Intel launched some of them. And soon, like uh, in the conference, we got to know that in, uh, like other companies are also advancing things and we will have also more green AI very soon. Thank you very, th uh, very much, and I think I am gonna finish it. I hope I got. Anybody? Or I'll volunteer as a tribute. <laughs> okay. Yeah. For the post scheme modulation, it is another hardware level, right? Can you give us an, an, an idea of how you can modulate the pulsing uh, with hardware and not software or firmware? The, the thing I showed you is just synapses. Of course, we need a periphery circuit. And these periphery circuits are built based on the transistor because I'm working on flexible electronics. So we try to have uh, the transistors we try to drag here to the work are the transistors that are used in display technology. And then uh, for that, we need to have a periphery circuit like around. For now, what I showed, it's like just a stimuli from an analyzer. But soon we will have the complete circuit and uh, STDP, spike time dependent plasticity model, because we are seeking actually a spike in neural network. It's very difficult, but we are seeking uh, uh, to have the performance like based on this neural network. And yeah, the periphery is actually Tin tin transistor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More questions? Uh, about the memory store, uh, it only stores data while there's energy on the system, right? It's not. It's not going to store data when there's no energy, like uh, an SSD, right? Okay. Okay. J just uh, it depends on the answer, but. If you still have, if you still need a separate storage device, it's still going to be very slow, right? So, how can you store everything there? So, let me tell you what memory store does. Actually, like in an SSD, for example, or a flash technology. So, what we have is a non-volatile memory. So, it is stored its information. And then we process things in RAM, which is faster, is in nanosecond, and so on. What memory store does is do two, actually, things at the same time. So it's it c it has a memory centric com computation. What is it? What does it mean? It means like it is store data like this. Co each conductance state is equivalent to bit. You can have even MLC like multi level charging in this uh, memory store. You can have like two bits per cell, three bits per cell, if I'm not higher, because it's uh, we get into bit conflicts. But, uh, and it uh, stores it, like as soon as you have that, it's the memory, it has a memory effect. And then you can write and erase 
very much faster than flash. You can write an array like SRAM and DRAM, which is actually very fast. So here, um, uh, that's why we can say this is completely energy efficient because you have memory centric, like there is no transfer mainly there. And and what I explain is just artificial neural network and so on. But actually, there are thousand different types like reserve computing and even more power efficient systems rather than what I present here. And for how long does a memory last? Very good question. This is now a technology is working on that. Because when we have very good memory stores and linear like reaction, as I showed here, sometimes we don't have good uh, storage and it works maybe a year, but it's enough for some of the tasks, of course, like if you have even minutes, sometimes it depends on the application. So and when you have non-linear response that is not very good, they can be exactly like SSD, like they can store 10 years. Yeah, and this is where actually technology is working on right now. What is currently? What is the the max size of memory you can you can have in one of those? On the memory store size, I would say like here in Portugal. <laughs> okay, so let us uh, talk from here. We have actually very interesting device that is the two micrometer size two by two, and it has a certain characteristics that apparently is very interesting for the Europe because even we presented, it's a device that can have linear response and we try to solve this dilemma of retention time, like to see how much. So this is the device here we have in Portugal that is quite nice and now we have collaboration with actually many countries and in European project, they are very interested in what we are building. We were building and uh, doing some progress. But there are devices really, really small, like um, uh, I have to say like the biggest center is in Mulish in, in Germany, in Europe. And of course it's in Stanford, right? Yeah. And they, there are devices that are different type because this memory store I showed, actually I have to mention, this is one type of memory store. We have a spintronic memory store. We have uh, a lot of uh, quantum, optical and so on. And then they have different device size. And uh, the smallest I showed, it was four square nanometer, but that one is not functional for the circuit. It has some uh, still problems, but there are uh, really like 70 nanometer square that they are even used in the uh, circuit, but another type, not the ones that we are dealing with in Portugal. So essentially the software and hardware neurons work more or less the same way, but there is less noise. We could expect a faster learning process with less errors to sort out. Yes, uh, we are working on it to make it done on hardware. Of course, on software, everything is easier and everything is already very well established. But I showed this come this uh, problem, the carbon footprint, and we try to have that. And uh, still the technology level, like the readiness of these technologies is still very low. So it's not really in all industry. So we don't need now to change our laptops and everything and say, hey, all of us, we use neuromorphic computation, but this is foreseen. Yeah, that it's going to be faster. Okay, more questions? Um, so we, last time we saw com quantum computing and uh, this kind of computing uh, is, is used for very specific situations, okay? So uh, as we were told, um, it, it, it doesn't uh, or it will not substitute the, the current uh, computers that we use. Um, is this the same or, s or uh, is this just a niche thing? Uh, are we going to have uh, everyday electronics?
electronics that uses this kind of um, uh, uh, hardware, let's say. <laughs> Very nice question. Quantum computation. In quantum computation, actually, it works in a very, uh, especially for certain applications, it works in very low temperature. This means a lot of energy. So it's not energy efficient to use it every day. So there are some problems. Then we need to solve those problems. So we go and seek for that. It's accurate and so on. This is a everyday paradigm. So we actually want to have this in everything, all the sensors, every computation that is happening. So we would like to have this kind of like systems, like neuromorphic computing, memory centric, and using this sort of hardware, actually. This is very energy efficient to build in terms of like economy. Also, it's low cost. And at the same time, it's very efficient. It's fast and uh, has low carbon footprint. Quantum computation has huge carbon footprint. <laughs> More questions? Okay, I do have one question. Um, so we see that part of the computation is already happening in the hardware, uh, but a part of the computation will always have to be uh, sustained by the software, right? So, uh, and you will always have to somehow push it to the cloud. Do we know already a percentage of how much computation can we have on the hardware? and how much would be then go to, to the rest? There is a care and work now we are involved actually, and it is um, like mainly, for example, in this care and work, we do some classification of brain signals, right? Like the first step of classification, it's happening on hardware, and then the labeled ones are sent to the cloud, and it's completely efficient in this work. But if I have to give you the number, we I cannot give you just yeah as a qu like uh, a, a number, like percentage or so on. Yeah. More questions? Okay, I do. Ha okay. Thanks. Um, I have a question related to the memory store. Is it how it's said? It uh, has one input and one output, right? Can it be flipped and behave the same way, or does it uh, does it have to be connected uh, in a specific? You mean like no, it cannot be flipped actually it in this uh, structure that I showed. Yes, we work with the device. Actu it, this is two terminal. This is this looks very easy, like a snap, like a resistor, but it's not actually. Uh, that's why I said thanks to nanotechnology, we can build such a device. I didn't go deeply into the device uh, structure, but in this device uh, structure, although it is in nanometer, you need to have a certain composition, which is called this active layer. And in some companies, they don't even put it there. So they put X, Y something because they don't want to show that what is there. Uh, we had a presentation from IBM and they showed amazing device, but then they showed that this is like a black box there because it needs a certain engineering. And, uh, but ours is completely open science. <laughs> you can read in our articles how we design this active layer between two contacts. It cannot be flipped. If you flip it, right, and I it's going to be a different uh, functionality. But for certain things, you can make it in series, in parallel, for certain circuit blocks that you want to use and build. For example, you want to build a oscillator or you want to use it as an RF switch. There is also another project with uh, zero hold voltage and so on. So you can have different designs. But in what I showed, it should be connected like exactly as it is. Yeah. Um, okay, one more question. Um, the so uh, uh, as I understand it, it stores information and information might be, f for example, how many times it has been, has been passed current through it. Um, how is the output different if it has passed once uh, current through it and if it has passed zero times current through it? Uh, 
So normally in this memory technology, even on the flash technology, you need different conductance level. Like flash is a transistor, but a floating gate transistor. Let us go back to just SSD. So you have a different conductance, and it's like this. If you have, for example, four level of current or conductance level, it means two bits. So two to the power of n, that is n actually is number of bits, and then the result is the number of conductance. The same is valid here. So we can have different level of conductance, and it shows the number of bits. If we have, for example, we want to have um, two bits per cell, so we need four states of current, right? If we want to have three bits per cell, then it is two to the power of three, so we need six states, right? It's, uh, sorry, eight states of the current, right? and uh, further and further. It's like, uh, it's uh, exactly similar to the previous technology, like a flash technology, mainly. I don't know if I answer correctly, or you talk about endurance. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More questions? <laughs> okay, then, oh yeah? So it, there's uh, four uh, uh, li with levels of output. Are there also four levels uh, input or only one? Yes, four level. Like if you want to program this memory store, for example, to two bits, so you need four level of conductance, the input is a voltage the ones that I showed, and it should be different voltage input for each level, because otherwise you cannot have these four states. So once at a certain voltage, then another time, or the input, as I showed, that a spike has like an amplitude, let us call it the voltage, like um, potential, and the time. So you either change the time with different, like four, for four states, or change the spike amplitude. It needs to have it like that. How can we reset the memory of, uh, of the memory store? It's a very good question. I was missing the IV characteristics here because I was thinking like it is too technical if I go to it. In the, uh, like everybody maybe is familiar with the transistor, but this memory store has a certain electrical characteristic which is called pinch hysteresis. So it's like a butterfly, when you apply the voltage, it goes on on one polarity and off on the other polarity. So you apply, for example, positive voltage, then you have a lot of levels and you want to erase it, you apply negative voltage on it, like on this certain, certain one. Of course, uh, the, the, the other uh, ones have uh, different functionality. So I didn't show actually this pinch hysteresis <laughs> here. <laughs> but uh, you can search it, immediately the pinch hysteresis come and you see this beautiful butterfly there as like you with the application of the voltage, how you can tune it and you have a memory window. Processing the data, just a second. <laughs> Vocês podem enviar também e-mail e vocês podem ir para também a faculdade, para nossas reuniões. Falamos muito sobre ciência e mostramos coisas novas. So, yeah, email me, contact. Yes, I will answer, definitely. Mm -hmm. Also, I think one of the questions we've had in the past is to make the presentations available. So we're going to try to arrange this uh, with, with Carol and Diogo to see how we can make them available so you can see it uh, later on. Um, are the memory stores made with semiconductor materials or conducting materials, insulating materials? So no, 
Now you're going to black box. All right. So <laughs> yes, it is semiconductor. In ours in Portugal, it's semiconductor material. And for the first time, actually, we applied uh, semiconductor material. I, the, uh, let us call it um, the common ones, the ones that produced like in other institutions are not actually uh, based on semiconductor. They are sort of insulating materials, but completely defective. So that's why the, the formula is not there, so you may not know. For example, if it, it is a certain, I don't know if you know, like the, in chemistry, the stoichiometric, it's not a stoichiometric, so you don't know the amount of ions there used. In our case, also, there are some things and some tricks, of course, to do. It's the semiconductor material. It's the same semiconductor material as used in display technology. Why? Because we want to have even more low cost fabricating transistors from display, get every maturity of technology from the display technology and use it also for the periphery of our memory stores of the same technology and same uh, run of fabrication. So in our case, this is a semiconductor. And the material is called indium gallium zinc oxide. Yeah. How many memory stores uh, can we have on the same chip today? Billions. Yeah, it's very small. And actually for every node that I showed, you need a crossbars, which input is the number of nodes that you have. The deeper your network is, you build more in, like in sequence and they are all connected. You can have a lot. And uh, the voltage you need to send, how does it compare to a normal transistor? Very low voltage of operation compared to transistor, yeah. Uh, like, for example, in these ones that I showed, they are current controlled, which means like they need to reach to a certain current to switch on, and they work between 1 to 1.2 volt. It's still high. For me, we have even lower ones. Like in literature, you can find even lower ones. Yeah. Uh, what's the flexibility of the material uh, a need for the memory system, or just a device functionality to produce anything? We work on flexible electronics because of certain applications we target. Actually, we would like to have uh, to use uh, our system for wearables, for healthcare appli applications. So that's why we use flexible electronics. But in a normal, like memory store application, it doesn't need to be on flexible substrate. It's normally rigid. Actually, it's very challenging to have it on flexible. Nowadays, you see, actually, uh, we have a lot of um, devices and so on, like um, the mobile phones, right? They try to build a flexible display, and it is always failing. It's very challenging. And but we are trying to have it because of wearable applications and healthcare applications. Questions? Sorry. Sorry. Um, regarding the flexibility, how flexible have you managed to do it? Like uh, I saw the, the image was around the finger, but can it break if you fold it or what happens? Uh, we do not break memory stores, but transistors. <laughs> yes, yeah, because they are large, and memory stores are small. So normally, with this uh, radius that you saw, we don't break those devices. But the problem is on the switch side. So, and the solution, what we are thinking is like, how if we build the crossbars without switch? So we need to design and engineer our memory store that work in a certain level that they don't need switch. And it is also a, another project that we have to get rid of transistors actually on the crossbar. Okay, I, I have one more question and then I'll hand over. Um, so we are doing already um, very close um, 
neuromorphic. Uh, so w we're already mimicking the brain, right? So uh, in the future, do you think also this is the future of technology for brain machine interfaces and for having for achieving the real AI, like having s only memristors doing all these synapses communication? And can we use this type of technology since we know that with transistors is not possible to mimic certain behaviors of the brain for medical applications, for example? Yeah, very good question. Yes, definitely. But the problem is we don't know how brain works. So we grab one of the model, which is plasticity, and then we start to, to work with it. And I still with been neuro neuroscientists because I, ha I was involved in a project that we didn't get the funding, but I noticed that neuroscientists have a lot of fight over this topic that how brain works. So we try to mimic something that we don't know how it works, but we have some models and we try to build this artificial intelligence based on that, that model, but definitely it is future. Neuromorphic computing and also like uh, it's, it's like uh, two science at the same time growing, developing and mimicking like the artificial one, of course, emulating the real one. Are there um, theoretical machines which uh, already work using memristors? Like, can we build a, a calculator, for example, using memristors? Uh, yes, I actually guide you to go to those European projects from Brussels, and there are some machines that they they are built recently in the consortium, like a European consortium, and they show functionality for different types of sensor interface, for example, on the healthcare application or normal sensor, humidity and like a temperature sensor and put uh, some classification jobs and so on. From top of my head, I cannot say the names, but I can actually uh, send it to maybe Carolina, like this existing technology. Besides of that, there was one product is called Opton from Intel, and it ha has a combination of, um, it was between a collaboration between Macron and Intel, and uh, they uh, had a SSD, like non-flash, combined with memory store technology, and they build it, build it very efficient uh, in terms of speed and so on. But I'm not sure that it's already produced because you know in this industri in, in the industrial agreement, if Macron and Intel don't like something, then I think now they are actually discussing over who uh, has the PI rights. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, but it is exist. You can search Optan, and then you can see this technology is used. But I don't know it if it is from Intel or Macron. It's an agreement. Yeah. Hi, um, not in, not in a technical level. Uh, I would like to know the the well the processors nowadays the the most powerful processors are built. I think it's in America. They they own the technology. Uh, with this technology, uh, well, first question is is it uh, easier to to produce than the most powerful processors? It looks very complicated. But I don't know. And um, if uh, if it's going to allow like Europe to have uh, companies building processors like this or other companies like in Africa, China. Yes, very good question. It's a race time, really. Unfortunately, in this um, science, nobody reveals nothing because actually they are working on it. So there are many patents available, but you know nothing. So. Yes, it is coming. <laughs> yeah, like I, I'm sure, like all these industries are working on it, and from time to time they have presentations in scientific conferences, and we get to know like those black boxes, like how they they work. But it's not like university that we publish and open science. But yes, it is gonna be very efficient, and industry would. Who is first? Which one is first? Is the winner, right? Of course, they don't wanna give the secrets, right? So you, you said that um, 
we are trying to mimic something that we don't know how it works, okay? Can, um, or is someone actually doing uh, the other, th uh, the, uh, the things the other way around? So trying to understand how our brain works by using uh, uh, this new technology. Yes, actually, I know a group in Netherlands, they do this, right? And they try to understand it, like they have a, it's a, a very nice, like a system they built, and then they have collaboration between neuroscientists and machine learning people, and they really start to study all of these brain signals. It's, it's just crazy when you see the equipment and how they collect data, but of course it's not, we don't let anybody put a chip here, right? So they are certain disease, they need to survive with the chips, right? So they allow that the data get analyzed and then, because the problem is also data, we don't have a lot of data, right? Because we don't let this go everywhere and uh, yeah. But I it exists, yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think so, I think, yes, but um, well, you know that this uh, Neuralink, United States is the first, but we would like actually to have, but the science is in Europe. So we, I don't know if you are, you know, there was a very fam uh, famous graph that all the articles, publications and science, like 90% is exist in Europe, but who implements is Elon Musk, right? <laughs> I mean, like we don't implement it in Europe and this is a real problem, right? Like we, we do a lot of science, but uh, the gap between industry and the science part is really large. Mm, there is no fund really easy to really implement your idea for like a little company. The ideas are getting lost. You pay patents, no investor comes. So there are problems in Europe really, which doesn't exist in other continent. So then they implement our science, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, I don't know if you guys saw the news about uh, Neuralink's chip um, to be implemented in the brain for somebody that is quadriplegic. And I think if there was already a lot of candidates, I think like thousands of candidates to, to have this surgery because it can be uh, life revolutionary for them. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can actually mean that they get a little bit back of their lives. So, um, yeah, I think this one was go is going to be groundbreaking. There's also another um, American company, American-based company, but the CEOs are actually in Portugal called uh, Neuroverse. And um, they are doing um, AI-powered um, wearables that and they do like um, neural recording. And uh, the problem is always like the adoption of the public, right? Because we're already very used to these guys, right? The, the smartwatches and it's in my arm, it doesn't bother me, it, it's there. I was used to, to wear a, a watch before, so it's okay. So now imagine going around with something like in your forehead or something, it's a bit more drastic and, and, and people often feel like, I don't know, people were complaining about 5G, interfering with their brain waves, right? And stuff like this. So of course people are afraid to adopt these kind of wearables. And then it affects all the data you have to train your models and to, to study the brain. And also the brain is quite shy. So actually when, when you're recording from outside the, the, the skull, uh, it's like being outside of a stadium. Like you hear chanting and you hear that there's a party going on there, but you have no idea who scored. Um, and you have no idea what the lyrics are. And actually when we try to do recording in vivo and like we open a, sp a small like opening in the brain and we try to record it in there, even if it's not invasive, uh, the brain will shut down this area and prevent you from any kind of recording almost like it knows that it's being recorded. <laughs> so the brain is not like the easiest <laughs> organ <laughs> to deal with and to get data from. 
even though we know that all the data is being processed there. So it's, it's a bit frustrating also for the people that work in neuroscience or nanotech because, yeah, actually the thesis about neuro recording was the reason I entered nanotech. Um, and yeah, it's super cool. If someone come up with an idea to fix that, well, years. And with this, um, we're gonna finish our round because we already took some, some time, but it was feeding you with knowledge, so I hope you guys enjoyed. And uh, we can talk about uh, the next sessions, right? So, so the next, do we have an uh, image for it? No. Um, it's connected there, yeah? Okay, so we have two more sessions for our uh, master classes. The next one is going to be in uh, School 42 in Porto. Uh, so our Porto colleagues also have the pleasure of having some of these events. And um, it's going to be about cybersecurity. So we have presented a lot of technologies that are going to be disruptive in this field of cybersecurity. So how can people from cybersecurity actually prevent some of the issues that are coming with AI and pattern recognition, for example, or also quantum computing, decrypting um, the encryption algorithms. So this is going to be our next talk. And then the last talk that is going to be on the other week after is how to be an entrepreneur um, within all these disruptive uh, technologies. So how can we actually profit from these new technologies and build our own um, businesses and ideas on it? So, yeah. <laughs> See if we can... Uh <laughs> okay, there it is, exactly. So on the... On the 20th of November, so next Monday is going to be cybersecurity, and then the Monday after is how to be an entrepreneur, and then we come to an end. Yeah, I think that's all. Yeah, and thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. Um, and that's it. I hope you enjoyed it.